Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are and watching us from. Welcome to Acfilm Talks, your weekly talk show that always looks at the thing behind the thing within the, the politics of the day. And today we are discussing the politics of GMOs in Uganda. But before we get this started, please allow me to welcome everybody, grab a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, and be part of this conversation by uh, following us through our social media platforms on all our Facebook page, uh, YouTube account, and on our Twitter handle. You can also send in your questions, uh, your comments, and we'll be able to uh, read them and also ask the panelists that have joined us today if there are any questions for clarity. But today, before we start, let me first lay some bit of a foundation on this discussion uh, uh, that gathers us here today, the politics of GMOs. As you are all aware, uh, if you've been following the events, the president has declined to sign the GMO bill. Um, and this is the second time the president is refusing to sign that bill. The bill seems to turn out to be one of the most controversial in Uganda's legislative history. Uh, you remember that this bill has changed its name several times, but this does not seem to have helped. It was first introduced as uh, a bill uh, on national biosafety bill in 2017. And in 2018, it was changed to the Genetic Engineering and Regulatory Bill again, uh, and introduced as well, and then presented to the president, who again, on twice in a row, refused to sign that bill, meaning the president must be seeing something parliament is not seeing. For those of you who are just interacting with this term, GMO, for the first time, GMO is refers to... Uh, in full, it is genetically modified, uh, genetically modified organisms, and it refers to organisms whose genetic materials have been altered using genetic engineering techniques. And I'm so sure the panelists will be able to break that down to the barefoot man to understand. Um, but the secret known is that uh, the secret known is that. GMOs is one way of controlling the world's food supply by just a few wealthy ag agro conglomerates. The bigger question in the room is where does this leave the ordinary Ugandan and how does the ordinary Ugandan benefit or lose in the bigger grand scheme of things? With me today, as we discuss this, I'm joined by two gallant panelists and today yes today we have a lady the last previous two sessions we've been having a male panel but today we have a lady uh let me introduce the lady she's called susan nakachua who is a journalist by training uh, but currently working with grain an international organization she hates the african program and she's based here in uganda she's a researcher and passionate about this area and she has widely researched on smaller older farming in Africa. Grain mainly works on issues with other partners around seed, issues around land grabbing and trade policy. Susan, you're most welcome to Actim Talks. Thank you so much for having me. Pleasure, always a pleasure. And then our other panelist who is no stranger on the set is Henry Muguzi, who is a, a, a democracy expert and corruption activist equally a researcher with a niche on issues around money in politics. So she, he will be giving us the spin. How does this now fit into the whole arena of money in politics, political financing, and the behavior of legislators when such controversial bills take center stage? Henry, you're most welcome to the show. Uh, and of course, Susan, uh, 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 um, we are happy to, to, to host you as well. And uh, for, to our viewers, uh, today is a very important day because we are going to be navigating the complex choreography of biotechnology, agricultural biotechnology, and its nexus on political finance. 
So um, uh, I think uh, it, look, it promises to be an interesting discussion. Thank you, Felix. Indeed, Have indeed. Good. Thank you so much, Henry, for being part of the discussion. And my name is Felix Kafuma. I will be moderating uh, this one-hour show and grab a cup of coffee, take your seat, and let's get this started. Let me start with you, uh, Susan, because you are here in the capacity of the expert on these things of GMOs. First of all, what, what, what are GMOs and what is the story behind GMOs? Break it down. Um, I don't know if I'm an expert. I think I just love food. <laughs> 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 so I think I'm at the point where I have to fight for food because I love food, but not just any food, good food. Um, GMOs are basically genetically modified organi organisms, and what that means is that um, they tinker, the, the system, all the companies that we know, tinker with the food the way we know it, and they tend to say that they, um, they, they, they can multiply the production of food by using um, technology, so the production of food using technology or using techniques that ensure that um, certain aspects of which, which they discover as weak in the food uh, are then enhanced. So for example, um, they, they can add just a little um, something in, in say cassava so that it can produce multiple times, it can produce for, I mean, it can produce longer. It can produce for, I mean, it can release for a shorter time so that we don't have a crop growing in the garden for over five years, it grows in the garden sort of like uh, very short three months, um, short term projects, and then the, the food is out and then you, you, you harvest it and give it out to, to the population. And they say that you can do it on a larger scale because the, the argument is that the smallholder farmers or the crops that we know of cannot, be, cannot grow on a large scale because then they require a lot of care and a lot of, um, of, of looking after for them to be able to grow. So basically, GMOs to, to, for a basic person is uh, sort of like getting a, a standardized seed for every single person. You walk into a market and every single person is selling the same seed, is selling the same crop, and is selling the same um, sort of like um, standard of goods. So the standardization of the seed systems, the standardization of all our food systems is part of what the GMO, GMO DNA is. But it's basically just playing around with the DNA of the food so that um, they tell you it's something different. Um, Susan, so yeah, just food. a minute, just a minute on that one. I'm going to allow you to make your original, but on that one, because you talk about if you increase, this seed increases yield, short span of growth is then, okay, then I'll ask, like a layman, is it a bad thing for me to increase my production? You see, that is what we are told. The public relation says that. Okay. The actuality of it is something very different. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So, so uh, and I'm going to come to you. So, if that is the case, uh, what is the actuality of it? Because you're presenting this, what you, what I'm calling the presented versus the fact. Mm -hmm. So, what is the fact here? The fact is, GMOs do not multiply. You cannot plant GMOs for over four or five seasons as a farmer. They are very expensive um, because you have to buy the seed. You see, there is a whole system behind the GMO production and the GMO ownership. And it is, it is, it is not only here in Uganda. It is an, a system that has been presented from across the world. So what we are implementing is not ours. It is somebody else's system to be able to commercialize the seed sector. And that means that the seeds cannot be your own. They have to be somebody else's. So you have to go to the market. You have to buy the seed. And you cannot replant it or reuse it after two or three seasons. So basically what this means is that the whole GMO system falls behind an entire commercialized sector that wants to make money. And how do they make money? They make sure that they limit the people who produce seed, and those are the smallholder farmers, and then they go and produce the seed and put patents on the seed, and therefore for you to access those seeds, you have to buy them, you have to pay for them, and you have to buy them every single season. Now, this takes away from what we know as the agriculture sector on the African continent, because we save seed from the previous season. When you go into the regime of GMOs, you cannot save seed by law. 
because the system doesn't allow you to. And by the way, this is in a legislative environment, which is not just happening in a free space. It is in a legislative environment. And therefore, that means that they will legislate on laws that allow you to produce, save, and distribute seed. And once that legislation environment is available, which we see in the National Biosafety and Biotechnology Bill, and that goes through the Genetic Engineering and Regulatory Act in 2018, all of these are processes to ensure that the GMOs come into the country and then they are, they are legalized. And once they are legalized, then, they, 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 then, they stop, then we stop recognizing our seed systems and start recognizing a commercial seed system. Wow, wow. Henry, uh, is this what the president saw or there's something bigger than that for the president on two occasions not to ascend to this bill? I think uh, uh, to build on what uh, my sister Susan is saying, the president must have been whispered it to in the ear that uh, the, the, the genetic composition, the whole choreography is not intended, it's not only affecting seeds, but also animals. In other words, your own uncle Kato, your long horn, your, your espoused Lugajo, is likely to disappear should, should you go down the path of, uh, of, uh, of uh, GMOs. But let me also add that the question, and, and I want to thank Susan for, 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 for starting on, on, on such an interesting note. The, the question is those who want to make sure that the, our indigenous seed disappears. What are they up to? To whose interest are they serving? The, the smaller question, the, the simpler question is, they want to make sure that it's only them you go to. And when it's only them you go to, then they have captured you. And who are these? Are, they, are these Africans? These are European companies, wealthy companies, that want to place the world on their knee, on its knees, and place it at their mercy. Uh, I, to give you an example, last week I went to my, my home village in 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 in, 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 in Mukaka. and I was speaking to this young man who tells me that uh, he has lock chicken, he rears lock chicken, so he was advised that look, uh, in order for your lock chicken to multiply and grow very well, you need to apply uh, I think vaccines, so he went and bought vaccines. And administered them on half the the, the 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 birds he has. On every single bird that he administered the, the vaccines, after three days they turned blind. They could not see, so they could not see. They could not feed. All of them have died. But those that he did not apply vaccines on have remained alive and kicking. What am I saying? They have gone ahead to make sure that we, we the herbicides we buy. The, 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 the veterinary medicines we buy have been injected, have been configured to make sure that they, they extinguish, that, that the African breed is extinct. The seed is extinct. So if you want to plant, to, 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 to grow maize, if you want to grow uh, sorghum, you want to grow uh, millet, you want to grow your, your guinats, you have to go and buy them every single time. Now listen. We live in a country where about more than half of the citizenry are living in the rain-fed economy, whereby for as long as they, there is rain, they don't need money. So these ones have been saving their seeds. When you take away their right to save seeds and prepare for the coming for the next season and start requiring them to go and buy every single season, there is going to be a time when this man living outside the market cannot afford to buy these seeds. And therefore, they will have nothing to, to grow, to plant. And therefore, they will have no food. Without food, they will perish. Either they will perish or they will be, they will be taken into as slaves on their own land. So the matter is really worrying. And, I, and, and it should be of serious concern. It should, it should trigger and evoke concerns of any compostmentist Ugandan that loves his country. Back to you, Felix. Thank you, Henry. Um, let, okay, we are talking about these companies, these, these conglomerates. Can we have some names here? Yeah, Susan, I'm so sure I've been in this area for quite some time. Do we know them? 
Did I lose Susan? Um, he seems to be having a connection problem. Okay. Um, I answer that question. As yes, Susan anyway, maybe you can attempt to answer that question. Because, of course, you have names. We have names like a buyer in Germany. You have okay. companies like Monsanto, DuPont, Syngenta, AgroSciences, BASF. So there are quite a number of them. And many of these have their agendas that have been in place for many, many years. Agendas that have been well orchestrated. That's why you are used very carefully the word uh, when I was starting the complex choreography of biotechnology. They have well orchestrated these things and, and put in place a framework and a machinery that will make them achieve their, their, you know, their desired ends. But now that Susan is back, uh, let, let me give way for Susan. Yes, uh, Susan, uh, you briefly dropped off uh, as I posed the golden question, and, and Henry has tried to mention a couple of those. those I wanted to find out from who are these, who are these companies uh, that are behind GMOs? I would like to say, I think um, Henry has done a, a good job in mentioning them because there are, there are three major companies. Uh -huh. um, you know that the seed system, the, the seed system has basically worked out a way to own the seed sector, and so Monsanto, Dow, and and Pioneer are the companies that have come in to help um, own the seed se sector and therefore to 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 influence policy and legislation, so that that legislation can talk to um, the protection of plant breeders. And the plant breeders then become the most important people within the seed sector. Now, um, just to give you a bit of a genesis, because it is not—it's not, it's not, only, it's not only these companies; it is basically a whole system. And when we talk about a whole system of um, the people that own Uganda's and uh, Uganda's seed sector, they don't only belong here; they're outside of um, of Uganda. So I will try and set the scene. It might be a bit long, but we need to understand where this is coming from because it, it comes from the World Trade Organization. So when the World Trade Organization was set up in the 1950s, the argument was around fair trade, trade for all, and therefore an understanding of a trade system which is, um, which is equal for every single person. And within the, that argument of the, of, the, of the World Trade Organization, then we had the 19, 1994 Trade Related Intellectual Property Rights. Under this, they ensured that they brought about related intellectual property rights to things like plants, animals, and microorganisms. And within that, plant breeders got an opportunity to, um, to, to get legislated into the seed ownership process. And this paved the way um, for Again, we, we saw free trade agreements coming in. So the, the, the hula balu around free trade agreements, like the economic partnership agreements, the, what we currently have on the African continent, which is the African continental free trade area. All these free trade agreements are basically WTO plus because within the World Trade Organization or WTO, we could have as African countries say, this is where the, this is where the buck stops. We can come back into our countries and make legislation within our countries that works for us and works within our own context. No, we didn't do that. We went into the free trade agreements, which helped the European Union to um, start legislating around the ownership of seed. So we, we, we saw things like UPO, we saw, we saw things like ARIPO, and we saw um, the legislation of seed and the seed system. So UPO and ARIPO basically are for the African continent. And they are basically intellectual property um, agreements that help the seed sector to be able to own, um, own them. Now, what we have to know is that Uganda is a signatory to the to UPOV and it is a signatory to the African Intellectual Property Rights, which is organization, which is a repo. And therefore, because we are signatory, these international intro instruments have, have to be implemented in our countries. And the way they, they, impl they implement in our, in our countries is through plant variety protection laws. And the plant variety protection laws that we have are the ones that inform all the intellectual property rules that run our seed sectors. So, for example, Uganda is signatory to UPO 1990, uh, 1978. And again, this is a bit confusing because we are signatory to UPO 1978. And it, it would be okay because within UPO 1978, there are still flexibilities 
for Uganda not to do anything else apart from um, legislate within our domestic areas. No, we didn't do that. We are a very ambitious country. We went and joined the East African community. And within the East African community, the regime that is leading the East African community is, um, is 91, UPO of 91. So because we are implementing UPO of 91 at the East African level, and the law of subsidiarity, which is basically that if, we, if, you blow, if you belong to a higher power, then your national policy falls away. So what we did as a country is that we said we will remain implementing UPO of 1978 at country level. However, because we are signatories to the East African community, and we just recently became signatories to the African Union, we start implementing UPO of 1991 without any trouble. Because the law of subsidiarity says, now we have to implement 91. So whether we want it or not, at some point, even if we say we are, we are implementing 78, we cannot con continue implementing it because we are signatories to higher powers. So basically, it is a system. What I'm trying to say is that it is a system. Even though we have national processes going on, and we have laws that are in Uganda that are going on, and we have a vibrant civil society that is coming out and saying no to commercialization of seeds, no to, to promoting of plant breeders' rights, um, we are again signing international instruments that are taking away from all those things that we wanted. So in a way, this is sneaking GMOs into the, 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 the conversation, it's sneaking GMOs into the system. And let me tell you something else. While we are legislating and saying no to GMOs and the president, we're so happy about him not signing and not what, in the free trade agreements, the GMOs are coming in because we have liberalized supermarkets and the trading system. So because of that, GMOs will continue to come in because we have a private economy, it is liberalized, and everybody can do what they want. So basically, apart from the international companies that are working on this, there are systems in place that are making it so easy for them to access our markets. And we've said within the African continent of free trade area as well, that we have a market. And that's what we are marketing. We have a huge market. So when you come to the African continent, be very excited because there's a whole market of about 4,000 billion people. That's a small number, but it's higher than that. There's a huge market for product, products and produce. The problem is that we have not talked about rules of origin. In that when something lands in Kenya, because we are in a free trade area, it means that it can cross to Uganda and any other country on the continent. And that is also easing access. So even if we don't blame these companies, they don't have to do anything. They just have to ensure that a free trade area passes. And when that free trade area passes, our governments are helping it along because we are all shouting um, free trade area. And when that happens, the goods can very easily, I mean, the seeds and all those other things that are GMOs can very easily move from one region to another, one country to another with no legislation because we've made it possible with the kind of agreements that we're signing. So yeah. basically what I'm saying is that companies, governments, systems can all aid the move for GMOs into our borders without any trouble. Wow. Felix, if I can come in briefly here, because uh, yes, Susan yes, can come in. an interesting thing. Mm. Uh, it's the whole notion of us, our politicians, political leaders and technocrats, specializing in signing anything and everything we know that every time they go to these spaces i think they get to be preoccupied and diverted by by trifles small small things and i don't know uh, I, as i learned from one of my colleagues that was on one delegation they get there and they get to be entertained with good food good you know good drinks you know and a few other things that go with the, the, the territory and then when they go back to their rooms they find a bouquet of flowers in the middle of a bouquet of flowers there is a white envelope when you open the white envelope there is a minimum of twenty thousand dollar so basically they get to be captured in those spaces when they come to meet these fellows to negotiate they sign anything and everything, whether it is a free trade agreement, whoop of 91, call it anything. It takes us back to the quality of the men, the men and women we have assigned the role of managing and governing this country. And that's amazing because you see the people that have choreographed this whole notion of seed, 
have, have, have trapped it in legislation, which is why today we are wondering why would Parliament be hell-bent on pushing for the GMO bill? Is this the most important thing we Ugandans need today? What is pushing them? Who are they working for? And then it takes us to the correlation. Could, is, is, it, is there a possibility that there could be a, a connection between campaign finance and, and, uh, and the sponsors of these, uh, of these choreographed efforts? that the bank rolled them to, to, to get into a political office and therefore they must uh in a quid pro quo arrangement scratch the backs of the other wealthy conglomerates as we said uh, to make sure that they legislate on these laws you know the the the, 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 the plant barrier protection laws that are needed to be in place in order to make sure that it is the interest of the gmo seed that are uh, that are insulated not the interests of the indigenous seed. Back to you, Felix. Thank, thank you so much, Henry. Uh, we are discussing the politics shrouding GMOs, and we may have Susan Nakachua and uh, Henry Mobuzi trying to get deeper in this issue and, 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 and kind of like lay it bare. But my bigger question to you, Susan, because you've painted a picture that we, we though without a legislation internally here in the country, we are already trapped by a system set. So, in such a circumstance, first of all, why don't we have such a conversation going on within the country aggressively? Why is it that the conversation that is promoting GMOs, because I can also tell you for, for a fact, I think I've come across proponents for GMOs speaking beautifully, very convincing. And I've hardly come across someone telling me the other side of the GMOs like you are. Why do we have this narrative promoting GMOs more predominant as opposed to the narrative that should be telling the truth and liberate our farmers? What's the problem? So I'm going to go out on the limb here and say it is money. <laughs> um, I explained a whole system and a whole sector that exists. The corporate sector has good money to be able to put into advertising, to be able to put into aggressive competition. And because they have a lot of money, they have made it their, their goal to ensure that um, they promote this very, very quickly, very fast, with a very clean, um, with very clean, sort of like clean, clean, clean advertising. That's one. Secondly, um, pay, secondly, painfully, we have seen um, groups of people that have come out and said no to GMOs and, 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 and no to the tinkering of our, with our food systems and all of that. And um, once that happens, um, then the person disappears and crosses to the other side. Either they've been bought or they've had an opportunity to get a bit more money and they, they can sort of swing the conversation to the other side. Um, but also because the narrative, um, these narratives, apart from the system that I talked about, colonialism, uh, and everybody keeps saying, don't talk about colonialism, it is many, many years after colonialism, but we need to be very realistic about colonialism. Mm -hmm. What colonialism has successfully done, and neocolonialism, what they have successfully done is to tell us that ours are bad, ours are inferior, and ours are not growing at a fast rate. That's what we've been told. And the narrative is pounded again and again in the media. We don't consume our own media 100%. We don't consume our own literature 100%. And when you see, for example, um, the, the international food chains, when they come into the countries, into the countries that we know, they have huge advertising. They have very good pictures and images and videos and adverts that entice, um, entice us to, to go and buy their stuff. But also, they have, they have invested a lot in, in ensuring that when they come and they say, this is part of development. So we are aspiring to a development model that is not necessarily ours, that doesn't necessarily answer questions around our development. Because you see, in our development, we talk about culture and we talk about food. And those are supposed to go in tandem with each other. We don't take them together. So within the, 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 the understanding of what is ours, it is backward, it is, it is not developmental enough, um, it doesn't show that you have class, and therefore you start losing out on the argument around ours. 
And as that happens, I think that is one of the biggest things because we now, even the education systems that we have sort of push us to go into the other side. So as industry is helping, it is, it is pushing the side, it is being helped along by a narrative that has been shaped over time. And as that narrative starts to, to, to catch on, um, we wake up in the morning, we drive through um, one of those drive throughs, you grab something and you quickly go. The convenience of, of doing things um, the Western way. Uh, if you're cooking food, the baganda, <laughs> you have to bear with me. You wake up in the morning, you cut the, the banana leaves, you start peeling. You it's, a, it's a whole process. And in a developed world, you don't have time to do those things. Mm. So the system, the narrative sort of tells you, no, no, you don't, don't waste time. We will be able to do these things for you. You can pick up a quick bagger and off you go. And within those, all those arguments, we start to lose out on, on, on what is morally ours. And I think that narrative uh, makes us look negatively at what we should be promoting and push for development that we don't even know, we haven't defined as our own. And that becomes problematic. So I think what I'm trying to say at the end of it all is that we need to define development in our own context and our own, our own understanding and our own systems and our own cultures. Once we do that, then we are able to push for what is rightfully ours which we are not doing at the moment because we have somebody else who's driving the narrative which has been there for a long time. So we need a mindset change. How that happens is another story altogether, but I think we can get there. Wow, thank you so much. Indeed. You are, you are allow me, Felix, to also uh, re um, uh, hammer this point. You, you asked about why <clears throat> are these things happening and she mentioned money. Uh, but I think she fell short of mentioning that the sponsors of these uh, genetically modified organisms have been so clever that they have identified young men and women in 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 uh, in government uh, research departments, agricultural departments. So they come to a an innocent, uh, fresh graduate, uh, promising uh, brain, and then they offer a scholarship. They have offered scholarships to many of them, so they go out there. Then they are also given in addition very uh, uh big podiums and many of them have have, have not stopped at, at masters they've even sponsored them for phds and those men and women have come back they're now the ones who are managing kawanda research institute namunoga cultural research institute the research they're doing is not towards promoting indigenous seed it's promoting the interests of 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 those wealthy agribusinesses now for you and me, the ordinary Ugandan, we don't even have this information. And of course, for many of the people that are supervising these uh, researchers in these agricultural research institutes, many of them don't even know what happened when they, the, the, the good boys and girls went abroad. They don't know how much dosage they were injected with in terms of uh, being uh, uh, brainwashed to serve the interests of the other companies. So we have entrusted now our offices our research institutes to, 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 to such men and women. And these are the ones who inform and brief the politicians. And, 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 and the tragedy of Felix is that because of the, com the, the commercialization of politics in Uganda, the quality of the people we vote at Occupy political office has gone down. So this person with the quality that is wanting and he finds them himself or herself being appointed minister, never mind, you can call them fishermen, and has to get briefing from that very uh, kind of brainwashed technocrat who is serving not the interests of the country but the interests of the other one, you will see that they will be briefed and the line of briefing will be that that praises the GMOs and why they must serve the other interests. So I think the time has come for the country of Uganda to wake up and, and understand that there's nothing better than our own seeds. Recently, I, I went to the market and, and bought peas. You know, there is a brand of peas on the market which you can cook for a whole week. It will not get ready. You see, we never used to have these kinds of peas, you know? So I think uh, the time has come for us to reflect and, and set an honest conversation on most of the things. Back to you, Philip. 
when you Thank say you that, so sorry to interrupt, but when you say that, I remember an example, a practical example that I can give with regards to education. Yeah. Thank you, Susan. I Susan, I, I will allow you to make that example after the break. I'll start with you. Let's first okay. go for a short break, then we'll resume okay. this discussion. Cool. 